I've been speaking English, as you know, for a little over 20 years now. One of the things I've noticed in my adopted language is that because of popular usage, some words in our language have their meanings diluted. For example, the word love, or the teenager's favorite like, or awesome, or sick, or bad. But I think one of the most popular ones who sort of had its meaning diluted is the word miracle. We have replaced the element of impossibility in this word with the idea of improbability, and sometimes we confuse the two. For example, professional golfers have a 3,000 to 1 chance of hitting a hole in one. That is a low probability, but not an impossibility. Now, leisure golfers have a 12,000 to 1 um, probability of hitting a hole in one. Now, take that improbability now, and, and, and it becomes even less likely. If I am the one playing the game, because I never played golf in my whole life, but it's not an impossibility because there is a mathematical possibility that I will uh, hit a hole in one. Statistically, it is possible. So it's not a miracle. It doesn't require God's miraculous intervention, although certainly God's intervention. Now, uh, here's another example. We refer to the beginning of life as the miracle of life. When we fully understand the natural idea of conception, when a husband and wife come together and conceive a child, so it's not really a miracle because we know how the natural process works, unless you're talking about Jesus Christ, because we know from what Scripture tells us that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, overshadowed, the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and she was found pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which means that God bypassed natural conception in order for Jesus to be born and therefore not inherit the sinful nature of his parents. That's a miracle, the virgin birth. Now, the first miracle of life happened in the book of Genesis. We read about it in chapter 1, verse 27, and that is explained in chapter 2, verse 7, when we're told that the Lord formed man of, uh, of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, because we know that life doesn't arise spontaneously, despite what evolutionists want you to believe, Creation, then, of the first man is a miracle. It required God to suspend temporarily the natural order of things. Um, so it required a, a divine act that functioned outside of natural laws. Now, this is true of our rebirth. Every time a new believer comes to faith in Christ, that is a miracle because you have someone who is dead in trespasses and sins, according to what Paul says, and then is brought to life by the miraculous power of God. So Jesus explains that in the next portion of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 13 through 30. And if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in that scene today, in that passage. Uh, and follow along with me. We talked about the previous scene last time. Today we're going to continue on as we do uh, verse by verse in our study of, of the Gospel of Matthew. Here, and uh, he tells us, Matthew tells us, that Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So church, here Jesus gives us a perfect example of the miraculous power of God on display, something that is impossible with uh, humans, he says, but it's possible with God. Again, when God temporarily lifts the natural order of things, that is a miracle. So what we have here then is God's miraculous power 
to save, to redeem. We'll start with that, his power to redeem, and then later we'll talk about his power to reward. But I want you to see here in verses 23 through 26 very clearly in the scene that we have, God's power to redeem. With the encounter of the rich young ruler in the background here, and you will remember this story in case you weren't here with us last time or if, in case you, you need a refresher, uh, a rich young ruler came to Jesus interested in him and said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave him half of the Ten Commandments to keep. Again, this is not a prescription for the rest of us. He knew this guy's heart. And he, says, he said, then you follow these commandments. And the guy said, great, I outwardly follow all of these commandments. Then what do I lack? Then Jesus says, sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and then follow me. You'll have a treasure in heaven. Now, again, this is not a prescription for the rest of us. It's a, a personalized case because that man loved money more than they loved Jesus, evident by the fact that he walked away, grieving, the Bible says, because he had many possessions. So that's the background of this story here. Now, Jesus explains that the love of possession usually prevents people from entering the kingdom of heaven. Why, church? Because People who put their trust in riches and in wealth hardly ever will recognize their need of a Savior because they say, I, whatever I need, I'll just go buy it. Whatever I want, I will just go acquire it. They will hardly recognize their sinfulness because uh, they usually associate um, wealth with divine blessing. That is the philosophy with which the disciples operated here. That is why they were so surprised when Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, church, there is a material as well as a social cost of following Jesus Christ. That's what we learned last time. Not that uh, you need to liquidate all your possessions in order to uh, follow Jesus Christ, but you do need to dethrone wealth and riches and money if that's the idol of your life in order for Jesus Christ to take the right place in your life. Jesus says, whoever loves father or mother or even siblings more than me is not worthy of me. So we understand that uh, he needs to occupy number one in our hearts if we are to follow him faithfully. And that's, uh, he's exp explaining all of this. There's a material as well as a social cost because people as today they do, people back then associated material wealth with blessings from God. So that man probably didn't want to follow Christ because they thought, well, people are going to think I'm not blessed of God if I do all of these things. But church, that is the reason why Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by loving uh, uh, for it, and some by longing for it, rather, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, this is the case of that young, rich young ruler here. He's, he never made it to the kingdom, but he walked away from Jesus Christ grieving because he loved money more than he loved God. Now, money is not the root of all the evil, according to what the Bible says here. Some of you may have a lot of money, and that's good. May God bless you and your generosity and your uh, and God bless the fruit of your labor. With financial resources, uh, God allows us to send missionaries around the world. He allows us to pay the bills in the church here, help others in need, fund ministries, and ex express generosity. So there's no problem in owning money or riches. The problem is these things own you. And that is what Jesus is talking about here. And he illustrates this point using a common idiomatic expression at the time using the graphic illustration of a camel going through the eye of a needle. Now, that is an expression. That is a figure of speech. Now, there was no gate in the area called needle, in case you heard something like that. And for the simple reason, well, you may have heard uh, uh, stories like that, that, oh, there was an, uh, a gate around the city uh, called needle that uh, people have to strip their camels in order to go through through the gate and enter the city because the illustration being that you can't bring your possessions to the kingdom. That's a nice idea. But there was no gate named Needle around that time because people wanted tourists to go and spend their money in the city. Just like today, when you go to a city, the local people want you to spend money there so that you can feed the local economy. What Jesus is doing here is using a figure of speech that was common to the listeners at the time. Now, you and I would have said it differently. For example, we would have said it like this. Money lovers will enter the kingdom of heaven when pigs fly. We would say something like this. And his point is simple. Salvation of anyone, rich or poor, 
is an exclusive work of God, and it's a miraculous work of God because you cannot save yourself, just like that rich man couldn't save himself. Now, it is impossible by human efforts for anyone to acquire salvation or to enter the kingdom of heaven apart from the grace of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 3 verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah cried out from the belly of the big fish, salvation is of the Lord, uh, Jonah 2 verse 9. And Paul later on it clarifies to the Ephesians, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So salvation of anyone, rich or poor, is a miracle work of God because we cannot do it on our own, no matter how good you are. Now let me give you some examples of rich people who made it to the kingdom of heaven who are testimonies even to the day of this impossible work of God. These folks made it to the kingdom by, by, by the miraculous power of God, and they, forced, they were willing to forsake their trust in money and in riches in order to uh, make it to the kingdom. Abraham and David, for example, now presumably they were already rich uh, but before, uh, after, after they became saved, but how about Isaac and Jacob and um, Solomon and Zacchaeus and Joseph of Arimathea and Salome and many others in the New Testament here? Again, they were willing to forsake their idols in order to embrace Jesus Christ as their Savior, and that is a miraculous work of God. Now, the statements then in verse 23 and 24 shocked the disciples precisely because they associated uh, the elite with salvation. They said, well, who, did, who can be saved then? If, if a rich person, it's impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, no, no, no. how can that be then? Because they're already... Uh, experiencing material blessings from God, then are they not going to experience spiritual blessings? And Jesus Christ explains then that the gospel transforms idolaters into active members of the kingdom of God. But you may say, Pastor, that, I'm, that disqualifies me because I don't have much money. In fact, Pastor, 2021 has been a, an extremely difficult year for me. Then I'm, I'm, I'm good then, aren't I? Well, that may be true, friend. But let me give you two thoughts. The first one here that we need to watch out for is the affluent are not the only ones who are uh, tempted to worship at the altar of riches. People who desire money may turn that into an idol so much that uh, they will walk away from Jesus Christ. That, that, that desire will occupy uh, their hearts so much that there's no room for Jesus there. There's no salvation. And second, let me tell you something you may not know. If you live in the United States, you are part of the richest people in the world. Did you know that? If in case you didn't know this, just compare um, the gross domestic product of other countries to your yearly salary. Now, you may not be uh, as wealthy as Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, but you are rich compared to the rest of the world. So all of us in this room here, I argue, would qualify for the impossibility of rich people making it into the kingdom of heaven if you are a believer in Christ. So we should not allow the American conveniences to take the throne in our hearts. Now Paul testifies to that when he writes to the Philippians in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content with whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In church, the only reason Paul can have that perspective is because he's a member of the kingdom of heaven who made it there by an exclusive act of God, a supernatural act of God. Salvation by grace through faith. And when you have Jesus Christ and you understand that, then you already have everything because you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. In fact, the psalmist says it this way, um, they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Because if you're seeking the Lord, it means you have Christ in your heart and you want to enjoy his presence. You want to uh, know him and that is your riches. That is your, your wealth. You already have everything. You will lack nothing. Now, the question for us and the challenge for us Americans is to determine the difference between a need and a want. But listen to Peter when he says, your faith is more precious than gold. First Peter 1 verse 7. 
Your inheritance is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Church, everything else that you own will fade away one day. We'll collect dust. We'll belong to somebody else one day. But your inheritance in Christ will not fade away. The Bible says it's imperishable. In other words, the laws of thermodynamics don't apply to our inheritance, which are in heaven. If you don't know what the laws of thermodynamics is, it says that everything that exists goes from good to bad. If you don't believe me, just look in the mirror and look at your pictures from 10 years ago. And you will see how the law of thermodynamics, the second law, will apply to our bodies. But the point is, whether you are rich or poor, if you are in the kingdom of heaven, God placed you there by a, a miraculous power, a, a divine miraculous power to redeem. Now, you don't have to liquidate all your assets to be saved, but if your wealth occupies the place in your heart where Jesus should be, then a camel will go through the eye of a needle before you make it to the kingdom of heaven if you're outside of the kingdom. And remember, the gate is narrow. According to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 13. But thankfully, God is still in the miracle business. In fact, people asked me this even before I came here. People wanted to uh, interview me when the pulpit committee was talking to me. And many people asked me, so what's your position on miracles? Do you believe miracles happen? I said, of course. I'm a, I'm a living testimony, and so are you. When a saved person, when a, when a sinner gets saved, that's an evidence of a miraculous work of God because a, uh, um, a spiritually dead person is now alive in Christ. And that's something you cannot accomplish on your own. That's God's power to redeem. But Jesus also talks about God's miraculous power to reward or to recompense, verses 27 through 30. Now, Jesus assures his disciples um, that the miraculous work of salvation not only brings salvation now in the present, but there's something else that will happen in the future. So let's think about it this way. If you're a saved person, if you're in Jesus Christ, a born-again member of the kingdom of heaven, your salvation has a past aspect. You were saved 10 years ago, 5 years ago, a month ago, 2 weeks ago, however long ago you were saved. Um, then there's a present aspect of your salvation. You are being saved, and now meaning you are sanctified. God began a good work in you, and he will complete it until the day of Christ. And there's a future aspect of your salvation, meaning you will be glorified one day, which we will talk about here now, because that's what Jesus says. In the regeneration, verse 28 here, there's something waiting for you. Now, Peter, again, and uh, you can uh, notice his uh, personality here all over again, Serving as a spokesman here to the group, compared the disciples' faithfulness to the response from their rich young ruler. Maybe he thought he could uh, comfort Jesus when he says, well, Jesus, as, uh, in other words, he probably is thinking, Jesus, don't pay any attention to him, to that guy who just left you. You got us, right? Uh, the, the, here's your comfort. Don't pay any attention. We have left everything to follow you, Jesus. Now, when do I get to cash in? That's his question. Now, certainly, the apostle thought of the time Jesus called him and his brother, which Matthew describes to us in chapter 4, verses 18 through, 18 through 19. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. So Peter has that in his mind, thinking, man, we left them immediately. We left our livelihoods. We were fishermen. We're not affluent. We're not rich. But we left everything behind to follow Jesus. Now, what's there for me then, Jesus? We obey the call of the Christian life to forsake everything else, to follow your plan for my life. What is in it for me? And perhaps you think of the same thing. You're saying, wait, wait a minute. I, I've left all of this. I have endured abandonment. I have endure, uh, endured uh, neglect or whatever to follow Jesus Christ, but then you hear, like Peter, that there's a treasure in heaven. You want to know about it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to know what the future holds for you as a believer in Christ. In fact, there's an entire book of the Bible that covers that. At least chapters 5 all the way through the end of the book of Revelation cover all of that and some other parts of the Bible too. And it's there by divine design. God wants us to know What's, what the future holds for us. So he gives us small glimpses of the wonderful future that we have as believers in Christ. Otherwise, you, your hope is vain. There's nothing to look forward to. But he gives us plenty of promises. So there's nothing wrong with desiring to understand his promises. The problem for Peter and the rest of the disciples is that they wanted to know 
their rank in the kingdom. And we know that because in chapter 18, verse 1, they came to Jesus and said, who is the goat, the greatest of all time in the kingdom here? Are we the elite? Are we the VIPs of the kingdom, Christ? Uh, three of them had experienced the Mount of Transfiguration, and the rest of them didn't go. So they were thinking, man, we, we are here. Uh, we are the elite, and you are our uh, servants. But then Jesus talks to them about the regeneration. Now, amazingly, Peter didn't get a rebuke this time. He is a master of getting yelled at. But this time, he didn't get a rebuke from Christ. In, in fact, Jesus gives them a word of hope. And in verse 28, Jesus mentions the regeneration. Now, you need to know that that word means to be generated again. It means to be reborn. But in this particular case here, he's referring to the resurrection of believers. So right there in verse 28, we are promised that believers will live again after our body dies. So my friend, when you breathe your last, if you're a believer in Christ, your body goes to the grave, but you're going to be immediately ushered into the presence of Christ forever. And there will be a re uh, regenera regeneration, a resurrection of your body. And whatever his followers lose for his sake... Status, comfort, livelihoods, or even physical life is only temporary because we are promised here that we will be a part of something called a reg regeneration. In other words, many fold gains await the believer in Christ. So right there, if you uh, are struggling to understand or, or to cope or to endure lack of means, lack of financial resources, or, 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 or lack of joy for whatever reason, you need to understand that this is only temporary. There is a reward waiting for you when we get to the regener regeneration, the, 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 the millennial kingdom of Christ. Because he says, when the Son of Man will, will reign, for my name's sake, he says. Um, so the resurrected disciples will rule with Christ in the millennial kingdom. That's what he promises here. And they will focusing on the, the, their, their main activity will be rendering judgment to the tribes of Israel for their unbelief. That's what Christ is saying here. You will sit, sit with me and you will reign over the 12 tribes of Israel, rendering judgment for their unbelief. Now, in Jesus, um, years after this promise, showed one of them the scenes of how that would happen. And he recorded it for us. It's in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 4. I want you to hear this. John says, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark or the, or on the forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, he's talking about... Uh, uh, Things that are going to happen during the tribulation of the end times here. The Antichrist uh, demanding the, the mark of the beast to be in people here. But uh, John saw a vision of how believers will reign with Christ. And I, I mean reign meaning rule. Not reigning like outside. And Paul adds an interesting detail here. In case you're wondering, well, well what's in it for me, Pastor? I mean, this, this is them. I, I, I've been hearing about them. Well, what about me? What does the Bible say concerning my future? I'm glad you asked. Because Paul adds an interesting detail here in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 through 3. He says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? The saints will judge the world. So my friends, you and I are going to judge the world. We're going we're to rule with Christ. And part of that rule, we're going to apply God's law, specifically in the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And, and there, here's more. Paul says, if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Now, he's talking about the context of this is that Christians in the church of Corinth were sending each other to secular courts instead of uh, solving their problems within the family there, the family of Christ. But here's how he finishes this whole thing. He says, do you not know that we will judge angels? So, my friend, did you know that you will judge angels one day in the future? But you say, Pastor, I thought the angels were good. Right. He's talking about fallen angels. Non-fallen angels don't need to be judged. So he's referring to demons here. So what a fascinating promise. In case you're wondering, what am I going to be doing in the future? Well, you, you will, if you're a believer in Christ, you will rule with Christ 
uh, he'll give you some sort of jurisdiction for you to rule over, and you're going to govern and sentence fallen angels. But more than that, you're going to worship and fellowship in a glorified existence because you will have a resurrected body, no longer limited by the physical limitations that you have now. No more back pain, no more knee pain, no more uh, headaches, um, a full head of hair perhaps. The point is we are going to be glorified, resurrected. No one will get tired. No one will get bored or frustrated. There will not going to be, there's not going to be any divisions because God is going to restore all things. Relationships are going to be restored. So you see, church, how the idea that the world wants us to believe in, mainly through media and and Hollywood movies and now Netflix movies and all of that, they want us to believe that the afterlife is a nebulous place where you are a disembodied spirit floating from cloud to cloud, plucking on a harp, wishing what's the passcode for the Wi-Fi here because you're hearing music from the party down there in hell. That is not a true picture of what's going to happen to the future of believers. That's exactly the opposite. It's true joy. You're going to be busy doing the Lord's work while people down there in hell are going to be suffering forever for their unbelief. So you're bright. your future is bright and exciting. You will be an active member of a theocratic society where Jesus Christ rules supreme. He's a benevolent king, and your inclusion there is only possible by the miraculous power of God, not only to redeem, but to recompense or to reward sinners like you and me. We don't deserve any of that. But that's all in the future. But let's talk about the present. Let's take inventory of your rewards as in, in, in the present as followers of Jesus Christ. Because that's what he says here. Now, there's a multiplication that he talks about. According to Mark, Jesus promised this to uh, his followers. And by the way, so, so that we can understand the harmonized account of what Jesus says here, Mark 10, verse 30, he says this, that Jesus promised then that they will receive a hundred times, every believer in Christ will receive a hundred times as much. Now, in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions. So wait a minute, pastor, you may be asking. I thought we don't buy this whole thing about the wealth and health, uh, the uh, prosperity gospel. What is this talking about here? Again, I am glad you asked because, again, Luke mentions the word in the present time. So clearly he's talking about a multiplication a hundred times as much. That's a figure of speech, again, in order to communicate many times as much of things in the present. Houses, brothers, sisters, and mothers, and children. So, Pastor, I only have one house. Well, in order for us to understand this promise here, church, we need to um, look at the context of the local church because that is what he's talking about here. The inauguration of the church is months away at this time because the crucifixion is months away. Then there's the day of Pentecost 40 days later. So we need to understand these promises in the context of a local church for one simple reason. You can only have one set of biological parents. You cannot have multiplied biological fathers and mothers. So obviously, he's talking about a spiritual aspect of fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and houses and farms. Now, Jesus does not advocate abandonment of the family, obviously, and and family relationships or spousal responsibilities, but he does promise a spiritual family to every believer in Christ, especially those who endure disenfranchisement, because of the gospel. Now, that was not my experience. My parents did not abandon me when I came to faith in Christ, but I know people who have endured this. I know of spouses who have been deserted and abandoned because they came to faith in Jesus Christ, and I know of children who have been disinherited because they came to faith in Christ. So that promise is much more meaningful and significant for them because they understand that they will receive a family that is called the family of God. They enjoy the full benefits of membership of the kingdom. Why, church? Because according to Galatians 6, verse 10, we are the household of faith. And because as many as received him, John tells us, to them he gave them the the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. And furthermore, according to Paul in Romans 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are children of God. So if you are part of the family, you have many mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters in houses, as we will talk here in a minute. 
seasoned believers, older believers who will take you on and, and, and engage with you in a mentor relationship. I have a few of those. Paul addresses Timothy as my true child in the faith. Obviously, there's no blood relation there other than the blood of Christ. Likewise, my friends, if you are a member of the kingdom of heaven, a born-again believer in Christ, you have many brothers and sisters united not by natural DNA, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 1, calls us the brethren, partakers of a holy calling. And as your spiritual family exercise or extends hospitality to you, you have many houses where you can spend the night and you can stay at in case of a need. And all of us have experienced that uh, in many cases. I, I remember a fellow pastor one time uh, when he found out I was in between homes, he said, oh, where are you going to stay? I said, uh, I'm not sure yet. We'll probably rent a place. And he said, no, I want you to stay in my house. He said, I said, really? Yeah, come and stay at my house. I have a place for you and, and, your, and your wife and your daughter. And you come and stay. He had a big house. He said, you come and stay at my house. I said, okay, well, let me pay utilities. He said, no. Let me pay the water bill? He said, no. Um, phone bill? No. Can I buy you coffee? No. Don't take the joy away from me, he said. I want to be generous to you. Don't take that joy away from me. I consider him to this day. He's twice my age. He is my father in the faith. Now, maybe you have similar experiences like this, but here's the reference here, an interesting when He says children or farms even. Now, what is that all about? I think this is a reference here to labor um, and the opportunity that we can help each other out here as a family of God to, to, to help each other out even with, with work and labor. I remember uh, a fellow believer one time was struggling this was not here. This was down in California. He was struggling. Uh, he didn't have transportation. He was having financial difficulties, and he, he was part of the ministry serving with me as a volunteer. And then one time he received, I, I got a call from him, and he said, you're not going to believe this. Somebody just gave me a car to drive. And, I, and he didn't know who it was. And I said, how is that possible? Don't you have to sign something? He said, yeah, but don't ask me how. So somebody, a member of the family, decided to, 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 to act as a, as, a, as a family member, spiritually speaking, and provided for that need. And in case you think that that's um, a, 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 a rarity, you say, well, well that, this just happens there. No. Let me take you to Acts 2, verses 44 through 47. That was the life of the early church. Luke tells us that all of those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property or pos and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were, talking, they were uh, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So church, here is an example of the early church, how they operated. But you say, Pastor, we are Americans. This is socialism. No, it's not. There's no government involved here. There's no theft from the government commandeering the means of production here. This was all voluntary. People were providing for each other as everyone had needs because God was laying that in their hearts. And that is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. When you are a member of God's kingdom or you're a member of God's family, you, be, you, you receive a family and you have all of your needs will, will, be care, will, will be cared for by your family through the provision of God. And Jesus promises still here, he continues in with the promise of eternal life, which believers receive at the moment of salvation. You say, well, Pastor, when do I receive eternal life? Right now, at the moment, the day you got saved, you received eternal life. 1 John 5 verse 12 says, whoever has the Son has life, present tense. If you have Son, you have the the life of, of son in you. Now, at the moment you die, you will be separated from your body. The body is going to go to the grave because 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8 says, to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. And eternal life happens at that moment for you in a resurrected state, in a glorified state. But you have eternal life now. You have the promise of eternal life in the present. And if the Holy Spirit lives in you, according to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22, that's the pledge from God. If you're a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and that's God's pledge to you that you have eternal life 
in the present. That's your present reward. Again, church, this is only possible because of the miraculous power of God with whom all things are possible, according to verse 26. So every believer in Christ, born-again believer in Christ, shares the same future and present rewards, meaning you have in the present a new family, many brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and houses and, and farms. And in the future, you have the, the great promise that you're going to co-rule with Christ. And you're going to live forever. And again, the disciples needed to understand this very clearly because they operated by a carnal system of competition. They thought that the kingdom of heaven has caste system, a caste system. So they thought, well, are we the platinum membership then because we are the apostles? Or are we in the president's club? Or in this case, the king's club. And the answer is, everybody's already in the king's club. If you are part of the God's family, you're a member of, uh, of the kingdom of heaven, which means you got there only by his grace, uh, through faith, uh, by a miraculous work of God, you have all of these promises for you. Now, obviously, we're going to have different uh, d types of rewards, different eras of service. That's also clear in Scripture. But I want you to know that the thief on the cross is uh, a member with equal standing with the apostles. They will have different... Uh, specific rewards based on the service that they have rendered here, but the point is, your future is bright if you're a believer in Christ. Your present may not be, and that's all a question of uh, pers uh, perspective, because you have the joy of the Lord available to you now at the present time. It's time to cash that in and, and enjoy the blessings of, 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 of being in Christ. That doesn't mean you don't endure suffering. Many of us do. Many of us will continue to endure suffering in this age. But let that be a reminder to you that you should be looking forward to that future time when suffering will be no more, when separation will be no more, and you will enjoy existence in a glorified state, cool ruling with Christ. Now, obviously, I cannot close the sermon here by asking you, are you in Christ? Are you a member of God's kingdom? kingdom of heaven because if you're not you need to take care of that today tomorrow is too late you need to take care of this today because the bible says today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts today is the day of salvation if you have not yet tell, told christ that i'm ready to be received in the kingdom of heaven i recognize my need of a savior i recognize my inability to produce my own salvation i want that miracle done in my life Friend, if you desire that in your heart, the Bible says you need to articulate that to him and you will be made new today. You repent from your sins and you turn to the Savior and you will be made new. You will be given eternal life. All things have passed away, the Bible says. Everything is new. Just let any of us know and we'll gladly embrace you as a new brother or sister or mother or father in the family of Christ. Father, thank you for your precious word and the promises that we enjoy for being a part of the kingdom, Lord. We know that none of us made it to the kingdom by our own merit or by own accomplishments, Lord, but by divine accomplishment alone, the fact that Christ came and died on that cross to secure us a place in heaven because he cried out, it is finished. He completed the work of redemption, Lord, and we have now embraced him as our Lord and Savior, not because we have this great faith, but because you have given us uh, a, a tremendous gift, and we receive that gift by grace through faith, Lord. And if there's anyone here listening to this message or watching us online who's yet to make a profession of faith in Christ, Lord, I pray that today will be the day of salvation, and they'll come to faith in Christ today, and they'll remember this day as the day they were born again. Lord, and uh, it would be such a privilege for us to walk with them, but we leave that up to you, Lord. Um, we just pray that you lead them uh, to a Bible-believing church where they can grow and bear fruit in their faith. But Lord, as for us here, we pray that you'll continue to give us a clear sense of, of, of awe and, and responsibility to communicate this message, the saving message, Lord. A four-year-old can understand the claims of the gospel. We just saw this earlier today. Lord, it's not rocket science. And we thank you, Lord, that the gospel is so simple uh, that it's available to anyone who asks. And Father, thank you for that great privilege of announcing 
that saving message to a world that doesn't know you and a world that is desperately seeking uh, to know Jesus Christ. And Lord, what a great honor and privilege for us to be the announcers of salvation. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.